2.6 trillion US dollars. That's one of the figures the World Economic Forum estimates basic corruption costs the global economy each year. So if simplistically, very simplistically, you were to split that figure by the world population, that means the cost to each of us as global citizens each year is just under two and a half thousand TT dollars. Each of us, every man, woman and child on this planet, each year, every year. And of course that's highly simplistic because those countries where uh, there is less corruption mask the true figures where corruption is more rife. So forgive me for foregoing the protocols, I mean no dis disrespect to any of the senior figures here today, but this issue, the cancer of corruption which affects our societies, is so important and so urgent that I believe there is no time to waste. Corruption damages us all, and we need to get to the heart of the issue, the facts, the figures, the action that needs to follow as quickly as possible. I, I said global citizens deliberately, because corruption affects us all, wherever we live, whatever our nationality. None of our countries are immune. So I, I don't stand here to preach in any way. I stand here with humility. In Britain, we have suffered our fair share of corruption. Britain, Trinidad, Tobago, we're all islands. But transnational crime and corruption don't really see us that way. They don't respect our borders. And we don't want corruption crossing those geographical borders. Uh, I'm very clear Britain, my country, does not want funds in the reputable financial centre, uh, which is the city of London, if they are corrupt. So corruption runs counter to our shared human values. It rewards those who don't play by the rules. It creates a system of patronage where resources are shared by a small elite, while the majority are denied the benefits and proceeds of growth, which are rightfully theirs. But tackling corruption isn't just morally right, it's economically right too. Companies complicit in paying bribes find they face higher costs or operating in an unpredictable environment sign contracts which then can't be honored or completed. And services and people suffer, as we see. And the companies themselves face legal or reputational damage for being complicit in a corrupt system. Still more importantly, perhaps, over the long term, it's those societies which create and enforce transparent, stable rules which attract high-value investment. Investors are simply prepared to risk more of their money in those environments and those markets. So if it's all so damaging, why does it happen? I mean, I'm a diplomat, an interested observer in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, seeking to understand. So I ask people, I put the question to many here, and I've heard a number of answers. Well, High Commissioner, it's just the way of doing business here. Okay, but not in other parts of the world. Uh, and that doesn't make Trinidad competitive or get the best, best results for you either. The Anti-Bribery Act in Britain passed some years ago means that in those circumstances, British companies can't and won't compete and can't and won't do business here if they see corrupt practice. So you miss out on choice, the choice for quality goods and services. Trinidad and Tobago's global reputation suffers and we each miss out on building closer links. I've also heard it's because of the oil and gas wealth. Well, times have been good, High Commissioner. So as long as there are trickle-down economics, the country's doing well, everyone benefits. So I'll be straight. I've lived in too many countries to believe in trickle-down economics. And what I've seen that curious phrase mean is usually there is a gush of benefits to a small elite and no one else receives anything, which drives social inequality, social problems, crime. And if we believe in trickle-down economics, we kid ourselves, still more so when any country is facing economic challenges and it appears that God is temporarily not being a trinity. There's no gush, let alone a trickle. People suffer. So I've heard too that attempts to tackle the cancer of corruption have faltered in the face of accusations that such attempts are driven by politics or ethnicity. I hear it. I don't buy it. I know after two years here that politics uh, are pretty lively. But it comes down to a simple principle. If you do wrong, you should be held to account. Your politics or your ethnicity are neither a cause of corruption nor a defense against it. If you've done wrong, you face the music. 
whatever your position, whatever your politics, whatever your beliefs, I've seen enough scandals and defensive moves in my own country to know that is the only path. So what's the answer? Well, I don't claim to have it, but I do see the need for an integrated, comprehensive approach to corruption. And wider experience, global experience, suggests three elements we need to pursue together to get results and see real change. First, as we've heard this morning from the Attorney General, governments have a significant role to play in tackling corruption by passing legislation and introducing measures for its enforcement. I've already mentioned the Bribery Act in Britain. It had significant impact. It means that any British company engaging in corrupt, a corrupt practice anywhere in the world is subject to prosecution in Britain. So I offer a handful of questions. What honest objection could there be to new procurement legislation in this country which seeks to hold officials to account and ensure they drive for value for money and accountability to the public of this country? What honest objection could there be to the introduction of whistleblower legislation as long as it provides reasonable protection both to those who seek to speak out against corrupt practice and those against whom unfounded accusations might be made? And what honest objection could there be to resisting the introduction of measures like unexplained wealth orders, which simply require people to show how that wealth has been acquired? If you have nothing to hide, I see no honest reason to object. Second, there need to be in place measures to reduce the opportunity for corruption to take place, measures to tackle the enablers through strong institutions and regulation. I've been around the world enough to see where the strength of our democracies lies. It's not in free and fair elections, though those are important. Instead, I'd argue, as we've heard from others this morning, our democracies depend on the strength of our institutions. Things will go wrong. As people, we're prone to make mistakes, to be drawn to the easy win. We're all human. But it's how our institutions respond to this, to hold people to account, to investigate, to provide clarity, those are the things that assure our democracies. The third element I see is the need for grassroots empowerment for citizens. I mentioned earlier how corruption has been explained away to me. And as I said, I don't yet buy any of the reasons. I still don't understand truly why people here put up with corruption as part of daily life. Where is the outrage? Where is the shame sh that should be felt by those caught abusing the system? We should all be in this together. When faced with the decision of whether to pay a bit more to someone to help us jump a queue, or accept a discount in return for a favor, or avoid paying a tax, we each have a choice. We can just go along with it, same old, same old, and knowing that someone lower down will pay the price. Or we can say no and break the chain of corruption. Perhaps that sounds idealistic. The cynics will certainly argue that there will always be corruption in society because people are too used to taking shortcuts. But while this may look attractive, individually we should all think a little harder about it because in practice, each shortcut is contributing to a greater cost which falls on all of us, that 2.6 trillion US dollars each year that I mentioned. So I leave you with a thought. If the community of global citizens who live in this blessed country are serious about tackling corruption, Perhaps they should be making some simple demands for transparency, not mud in the water, for accountability and taking responsibility, not shifting blame, for penalties for corruption, not impunity, for action, not talk. I end with two pledges. My first pledge is because uh, the transnational nature of the corruption of cancer respects no borders. My first pledge is that I will do all I can to continue to bring to the government, civil society, and people of this country, British experience, expertise, and, corruption, uh, and cooperation to help Trinidad and Tobago fight corruption. Because, as I say, it affects us all. And my second pledge is a personal one. I have in my hand my completed application to join TTDI's membership. <laughs> and it, this is gonna cost me 250 TT dollars. But you know, I would really rather invest that money um, in TTTI, helping them tackle corruption, rather than pay that two and a half thousand dollars, which I have no choice over, because that is what corruption costs me personally each year. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you for listening.